the American dream is to make loads and loads and loads of money, or better yet, to stumble across a downed small aircraft in the forest and find a duffel bag full of cash. So it makes America great, right? It's been quite a week for the US. It's great. America's great. Uh, we're talking about money today. And uh, I'm excited to have this conversation about money. Has anyone ever um, experienced a bank making a mistake in your account to your favor? Has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, Laura, maybe, maybe no one else has. In my second year of university, banks generally don't make too many mistakes this way. I think it was my second year of university. Uh, I was at U of T and I went to the, there's a Royal Bank right at the corner of Spadina and Harvard. And I went and just, just take out 20 bucks because there's this little great pizza shop there and I had a night class and I needed to get something so I was just gonna buy a slice. Take out 20 bucks and then when I get the little receipt out that shows what's going on in my account. I don't exactly, I can't remember exactly how much money was in there but like tens and tens of thousands, some like 50 or 60 thousand dollars. And I definitely did not have 50 or 60 thousand dollars <laughs> in my account, it was probably like I had 2850 and so when I took out the 20 bucks I was running, I could not make another withdrawal because you need to have at least 20. And I remember getting the slip and thinking, wait, did maybe someone, like a really gracious person, extended family member, <laughs> deposit some money somehow in my account? Like they looked me up at the branch and said, we want to give Matt $60,000. <laughs> so I went and got a slice of pizza and I was eating it there. And the whole time I was there, I could not get my mind off the idea of what will I do with $50,000. It was just, it was all consuming. I went to my night class. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like, what am I going to do? with like 50 grand. So then on my way back, before I got on the subway, I went to another bank machine, and I'm like, I'm gonna try to take out 20. If a 20 comes out and I only had like eight bucks, I know that money's still sitting there, and there is a party happening this weekend. <laughs> or it will be declined. And so I put my card in, I tried to take out 20 more dollars, and it didn't work. And then I said account info, and it was like way down, back to normal. So for maybe a period of three hours, I had this feeling of, I have tons of money. And my, my thoughts, I gotta be honest, weren't the most, um, the thoughts of what I would do with that money were very, very selfish thoughts. It wasn't like I was thinking, who can I bless? What can I do with this? What am I a part of that I can give this money to? It was solely based on what can I buy? What do I want? Where do I wanna travel? Who am I taking with me? It was kind of one of those feelings. Today we're talking about money. And I just wanna say a few things off the top. All fall, we have been working through our culture statements and on your table, there's little icons that represent the six statements that we would say define our sense of value and culture as a church, of what God is doing in us and where we're going. And, um, and so we finished that all, and we've taken our time in it. We've had really good conversations with some friends who have come in and talked to us about how they exemplify and live out those values. And today, as a result of where we sense God leading us, I felt it was a really good time for us to stop and talk about how do we contribute financially to a shared sense of mission and purpose an adventure with Jesus. Now, a few things off the top. If you are here for the first time, if you're a visitor with us, I fully appreciate that this would be like, oh, why did we have to come to a money Sunday at a church? Churches are always asking for money. So we have never talked about money as a church. We're a new church, about two years old. And we've never had a, money, a specific money conversation or teaching. So today is the day you just happen to be here. But if you've chosen to follow Jesus, this hopefully will still be something that encourages you and is thought-provoking. And if you're exploring Jesus, then maybe this helps you understand a little bit about what it means when we say as followers of Jesus, we live in a countercultural way. That the dominant view of our society when it comes to money is not necessarily the thing that shapes the way we spend and use our money and steward our money. So that's number one. Number two, I would say any conversation around money in a church involves the pastor. So as your pastor, I'm automatically tied into this. You know it, I know it, but that doesn't mean we don't have an honest conversation. My hope is that we have this conversation in such a way that we're inspired with what God is calling us to as disciples, and it's not about, well, what's Matt saying this? It's all about Matt. This is not about Matt, but obviously I'm implicated in this because I have the privilege of serving as your pastor here. So you guys pay me to help lead this church. So it is what it is, but I'm just gonna name it because you know it, I know it, but that still doesn't change the fact that we need to have this conversation because at the heart of it, this is a discipleship conversation. The Bible has about 500 some odd verses that talk about prayer. There's almost 500 odd verses that talk about faith, but the Bible has over 2,300 verses that tie into money, wealth, and possessions. It's the thing that Jesus talked almost the most about. And so, in some ways, the fact that we've never had this conversation is, shows that we're 
either I'm really nervous about it or we're, we're overdue. And I just think we're overdue. And I wanted it to come today because I feel like it flows best when we talk about our mission and sense of trajectory as a church. And so I hope that's what comes through for you. Um, so welcome to Money Sunday. Uh, psychology Today, I was reading uh, some articles over the last few weeks on connection between people's attitudes of money, security, identity, and wealth. And they, this one line really jumped out to me. It said this, money is perhaps the last emotional taboo in our society today. Money is perhaps the last emotional taboo in our society today. That really we can almost talk about anything and feel no shame, no sense of uh, protection or um, secrecy. But money may be that last thing for us in our culture where it feels like, ask me anything, just don't ask me about my money. And so I know this is, may push a nerve or a button, but again, our heart is to say, at the end of this whole conversation, this is really a thing for, between you and Jesus. This is not about me. This is not about what you say to me or say to us collectively. This is about you as a follower of Jesus saying, God, what do you want me to do? What does it look like to steward my resources as well? But I do know that this is a, a taboo. Uh, Ken Boa says this, without apology, our Lord said more about money than he did any other subject, except for the temporal versus the eternal. More than 10% of the New Testament relates directly to financial matters. And so we're going to look at a two quick New Testament passages that are a little bit of um, a contrast, a study in contrast, when Jesus has interactions with people who have money. And uh, before you jump to the place and say, I don't have any money, we're going to get to what this all looks like in a practical way. So don't shut down the journey here. So grab your Bibles or your app, whatever you want to do. It's going to be on the screen here too. Turn to Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. And uh, this may be for some of you... Uh, <clears throat> A familiar story, but turn to Luke chapter 18, and I'll read this out for you. And uh, just to give you a heads up, we're going to quickly read these two passages as a study in contrast, and then you're going to have a little bit of work around your table to talk about what stands out to you in these passages. So I'm just priming you that in about five minutes, you can either go to the washroom because you don't want to have a conversation, or you're going to be ready to have like a really quick three-minute chat around your table so we can listen and learn from each other. So let me read this. This is uh, Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard this answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. So this guy comes, rich young ruler, comes to Jesus and wants to know, what does eternal life look like for me? Really, he's asking. He knows he's kept all the Jewish laws and commandments. So in a, in a legalistic, ritual, religious way, he's okay. But he wants to, I think, double check to make sure, what is there something I'm missing in this? Can you tell me, am I good? I got this? Am I okay with God? So he asks, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, who knows all about this man, asks him a question and gives him an instruction that pushes directly on his most nerve-jolting space around his finances. And the man's reaction then, it perhaps pushes him in a direction that's just too much. It's too costly then to say, I have to surrender my wealth in order to follow. So Jesus challenges him there. You can talk more about that in a second. It just seemed too costly. Flip the page. Luke 19, 1 to 10. Another account where Jesus is talking to someone who has great money and affluence. It says this. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore uh, fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus! He said, come down quick. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly timed down, climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man keep to, came to seek and save those who are lost. 
So really quick, this is not a religious leader, as the previous account. This is a tax collector, someone who had really, for all intents and purposes, sold themselves out to the, sold themselves out to the Roman Empire. They were working on behalf of the oppressive Roman Empire in order to collect and defraud and take advantage of their very own people. And he had become rich off exploiting others. And in this moment of being confronted with Jesus, he gives half to the poor. His money is all of a sudden wide open. And he's willing to repay those he's wronged up to four times the amount. So Jesus responds, salvation has come to this house. And it's evidence that there's something that's changed in this man. OK, we're going to pause right there. Lots more to talk about. But I want to get you guys at least chewing and thinking about this. So we're going to give you three minutes to talk about either of those accounts, things that stand out as differences, common things, ideas, questions, thoughts. Uh, if you're really uncomfortable with it, you can sit quiet or grab another coffee. But go. Three minutes. It's your time. Go for it. The one thing, um, there's a lot of things we could talk about. For the sake of time, um, it's interesting that the one who keeps his money goes away sad. So we often say that money is not tied to our sense of happiness. And maybe in some small way that shows in this story where he goes away sad about its connection to Jesus, but he maintains his wealth. So he's sad in keeping his wealth. And the one who gets rid of his money, who empties himself, who's going to pay it all back, seems to be joyful and cheerful and happy because he has this now newfound relationship with Jesus. I think that's interesting um, to consider. Ecclesiastes 5.10, this wisdom book says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Uh, money is also very much a spiritual issue. Money, the way we spend our money, the way we use our money, it reveals our motives and our heart and our sense of what we're heading towards. Money also shapes us. It not only shows us where we're going and what we value, it also, in its own way, shapes who we are and continues to reinforce patterns. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, it says, wherever your treasure is, mm -hmm. there the desires of your heart will be also. What are you putting your money into? It's revealing your connection with your heart. And he goes on in another passage, says, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Whenever we have a conversation about money, there's certain things that I think inevitably pop up. First one is a sense of, oh man, I can't really consider giving or extending myself financially because um, I'm just barely getting by. Now, that may 100% be your reality here. You may say, that is 100% true, I am really, really just getting by. Um, Bobby and I in our, in our uh, married life together have had many, many different seasons in all kinds of different areas. Uh, in a financial way, we've also experienced some real struggles where we had people come around us who said, because of the position you're in, here's what maybe stewardship and giving can or can't look like for you. And it was a real gift to us when we were in a difficult place. So we understand if you're saying, I, I'm barely getting by. Others of us, though, that feeling of getting by may be more tinged or connected to the idea that we continue to overextend ourselves. So the choices we make put ourselves in the position where we feel like we're just getting by. That the reality is we just keep going forward and forward and extra money doesn't free us up to say now we have extra money. We just continue to extend ourselves. So the feeling may be very real, I'm just getting by, but what's causing it can be a whole host of different things. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and this is not about guilt, it is not about legalism. It is about for you at the end of the day to think and have a conversation either as a single person, as a married couple, as a family to consider uh, the, one of the other things I think people often say is, if I just had a little bit more, then I'd be okay. Then I'd be freed up. And my friend Joel Percy, he said this once, and it's always stuck with me. He said, the best predictor of what you will do with riches is what you do with your money now. So whenever we think, oh man, if we just made $5,000 more a year, then we'd be okay. And Joel said, the best predictor of how you'll handle more money is how you're handling your money now. And that's always stuck with me. I want to talk about the pattern of generosity, of radical generosity that we see in the early church. It was a very specific time and period. Not everything that was going on there is directly transferable onto us. But I do want to show a snapshot that the church that's emerging as the first disciples of Jesus, how they stewarded their money and resources. Because I think it's interesting for us to, con to make sure this is a part of our conversation. So in Acts chapter 4, this is what was going on in the, in the hearts and attitudes of the early church. It says this, uh, beginning verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind. There was a sense of unity and togetherness and purpose. Uh, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. 
There were no needy people among them because those who owned land, land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a, a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. So there's a sense of like, what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours, we're all in this together. It's this very fluid sense. So I'm not suggesting that we all buy seven houses on one street and we all jump in on them and we only need one lawnmower because one guy does all the cutting. And it's not what I'm saying. Sometimes when we, we love to go to extremes, we love to go to the place where it says, well, that's what they were doing, but this is different. And so what we do is we shut down the whole conversation. But the heart of it is that there was this sense of purpose and unity in what they were doing out of this mission that Jesus had given them that then compelled them to open up their finances and say, this is for all of us. What are we doing here together? There was almost, um, well, let me put it this way. If I'm making a major decision, there's lots of topics where I'll ask my friends, hey, what do you think about this? Do you think about that? What do you think about this? What do you think? Very, very rarely would we ever invite someone into a significant financial decision. I think maybe because we're afraid of what that would reveal about the way we spend our money, the choices we make, or what if someone says, are you really sure you should do that? Now that's not to like slam us, it's, it's to show that we all have this like kind of guard around our finances. I do too. For all of us, this area of discipleship, any spiritual discipline, fasting, prayer, scripture study, solitude, any of these things, giving, all of them are designed as practices to help us move towards God and be transformed by God. And giving is one of those things. It is about a progression of discipleship where we surrender to be transformed. But it's the one thing often that, remember it's that taboo we often hold on. Um, as followers of Jesus, when we say yes to Jesus, this is one of the most important ways that we demonstrate to our culture that we live and order our lives in a completely different way. This is the counter-cultural kingdom way Jesus' followers live. They did in the beginning, and we need to do that now. Uh, Tim Keller, some of you will know, he wrote this. I love this quote. He said, the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body, and they gave practically everybody their money. So in the kind of moral framework of what it meant to follow Jesus, there was this narrowing when it came to sexual ethic in a society and a culture that preached uh, promiscuity and a lot of uh, religious uh, practices were tied to sexual practices together. What we see in the, new church, uh, in the early church is that there was this narrowing in terms of choices of sexuality and morality, but this wide opening when it came to finances and resources. It's really, really interesting. That was completely different from the way their culture handled it. They were marked by radical generosity together. Uh, something to ask ourselves is, where does my money go? Whenever you think about, well, can I give? Should I give? What do I give? How do I give? Maybe the best first question is for you to do a little bit of a financial autopsy on yourself and say, well, on an average month, where does my money go? You know, if you have, just say round numbers, if you make $5,000 a month, if you tracked it for a month or two and just started to take a look at it, would you be surprised by what you find your money is going to? Would the choice of how you spend your money align with the values you say you have? Would there be tension points where you're like, oh my gosh, I thought I maybe spent 20 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month on that, but in actuality, I spent like 450 bucks. Would there be any of those zones that pop up? Again, it's not about legalism or guilt. It's about being aware of how are we using the money we have. And sometimes just taking a good snapshot over a course of a month is revealing to us in terms of our priorities and our choices that we're making with money. So maybe for you, your next step out of this is really just to step back and say, how am I using the money I have? And what is God saying in that? And then inviting God into this whole conversation. Whenever people talk about giving to the church, sometimes it stirs up resentment and fear and anger based on past experience. And that's legit, it's valid. Those things happen. But when we talk about how do we give our money, the answer should be cheerfully. How do you give? No matter what the amount, it should be cheerfully, it should be joyfully. Check this out, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one of us, each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not because you have to or it's prescribed, but um, not under those things or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, does anyone listen to the Science Mike podcast? 
So some of you may know that, some of you may not. He, uh, I'm not a super podcast guy. I, I get way too distracted when it's just like this audio, blah, 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 blah. But he, and I know some people love podcasts. Justin runs to podcasts, which to me, I'm like, I, how would you even keep track of what someone's saying? I tried that once, and it was a waste of time for me. But this one, this, <laughs> different people, right? But he had this one uh, time he was talking about the idea of giving and tithing and, and uh, giving money to the local church. And it really jumped out to me because he, he tied the science of what happens in our bodies when we give. And what happens in our bodies physiologically when we give in a joyful, cheerful way. And I thought it's awesome because it completely ties to that verse we just read. This is what, they, what science bears out. When you choose to give, your body releases the same chemical, kind of a chemical cocktail, that's associated with reward, pleasure, good food, friendship. So when your attitude in giving is like, I want to do this, this is what God wants me to do, I'm so excited to give and to belong to this group, this body, this mission, this purpose, you get the same physiological response as when you're like having a good party with your friends, sharing good food, that reward feeling comes with it. It's, it's really amazing. And they would say it's so potent that it counteracts depression and chronic stress in some of their studies. So it's good to give when your heart is in a posture of, of joyfulness and cheer. On the flip side though, when you feel pressured, forced, or obligated, all the potential health benefits go down the drain. So it's the difference between am I choosing to give out of a sense of like love and partnership with Jesus or do I feel like I have to give? And what happens even in our very bodies is tied to how we respond that way. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, the first time I, or one of my very first jobs was at this fish and chip restaurant on Weston Road, Jane and Weston Road area in Toronto. It's called Golden Crisp Fish and Chips. And uh, made $4 an hour. That's what minimum wage was. Welcome to how old I am. Um, $4 an hour. And I was saving up all my money for this, for Nintendo. And now not the newly rebooted one that I know is out there with all the games built in, but this was the original one that as it got old and dusty, you had to blow inside of it and blow on the games hoping to make Duck Hunt work or whatever you're playing. So I was saving all my money for this. And this was the first legit job I had where I would get a check every two weeks. And I think I worked something like 16 to 20 hours a week, a couple nights um, after school during the week and all every Saturday. And... Uh, it was an okay job. I was that guy downstairs who was making fresh cut fries with like potatoes and like slamming it through like, like this, like seven hours of this. And then when anything nasty happened as far as they were cutting up the big halibut fish and all the guts were everywhere, I was like, hey Matt, clean up time. So I'd be like sweeping all like this. Oh man, nasty. You wanna talk? So, oh, let me just tell you this, sidebar. So all the garbage from the restaurant, they thought it was really East Coasty to have this um, lighthouse by the restaurant that was where they put all the garbage. So it's like this big lighthouse and it had a door here and so every day at the end of the shift you put all the garbage in there. But really what it became was like this hot box to like rot all the food all week. So then on Thursday nights, which was generally my shift, I'd have to take all those garbage bags out of the hot box, out to the road. Anyways, I worked really hard to buy Nintendo is basically the point. And this is the first time my parents said to me, hey Matt, what are you doing with the money you have and are you gonna contribute to a sense of mission at our church? for how our church is involved locally, how our church is involved globally. What would it look like for you? And that's the first time I ever had the conversation openly with my parents where it was my money. Because up until, that, when, up until then, when we went to church as a kid, my mom would like give us a quarter, like, you put that in. It's like, it didn't cost me anything. I don't care, okay, sure, whatever, right? <laughs> Completely didn't bother me, didn't touch me. But this was the first time where I felt like, this is my money. I worked hard for this. I need this. I need Nintendo. I gotta save up for this thing. Um, and, and I got to admit that I started giving, but I didn't choose to give. I felt like I had to give. My motivation was that I felt like I had to do this because my dad was the pastor of the church, and I felt like, oh, this is what I have to do. I've kind of said yes to Jesus. I'm like 14 years old, 15 years old, and I'm like, I got it. I have to do this. So my heart was not tied to the spirit of cheerfulness or joyfulness. I gave out a sense of, I have to. So when that question comes, well, how do I give? The, the response will be, give cheerfully, whatever that amount is. And if you can't give cheerfully, then let's have a conversation over coffee about what that is. How are your finances tied to something inside of you that feels like any kind of giving puts you in a place of like, 
frustration or anger or whatever that looks like. Let's have the behind the conversation to figure out so that we can all give joyfully. So from here, here's what we're going to talk about. It's 11 o'clock. We as a church, and we're having this conversation because we have kind of taken some baby steps as a church and then some not so baby steps. So here we are. God's done some things in our church that I would have never imagined. Really, really exciting things. Uh, A couple weeks ago, for those of you here, we announced that Reunion is going to be, Eric and Laura over here are going to be planting a Reunion in Hamilton, and that's starting in January 2017. It will be its own church, its own leaders, but we're choosing to work together and rallying around our culture statements as the the glue that holds us together. And we all, most of you will know that Dave Drinkwalter is out in St. John's, Newfoundland, also doing that. And to be honest, I have two really active conversations with people in different parts of Canada who want to plant local independent church connected to a network of church planters tied together relationally. So it's super exciting. So a couple things. When we think about what we're doing as a church, this is a local conversation for us who call Reunion Oakville home. Again, if you're visiting, we won't have this conversation next week, but I'm glad you're here today. This is the kind of conversation that sometimes we need to have as we follow Jesus. This is a local conversation for us to say, we have a a parent family or denomination that's been supporting us in incredible ways. Um, resources and financially in a whole bunch of different ways. But when we hit 2017, it really changes for us. Our picture really changes, which is good. That's the challenge for us. The challenge then is to say, how do we own our own stuff? It's kind of like moving out of the house, out of your parents' basement. If you're still there, ride that as long as you can. <laughs> but, and my kids, you're out at 18, so. <laughs> no. um, but it's kind of like that idea is we're, we have our jobs, we're moving on up and we're stepping out of parents' home, and our parents are always there, and they'll be there when we need help, but we kind of need to handle things on our own two feet. When I was at university that time where I took out the money, I was working at a jan- as a janitor 24 hours a week at this church, evenings, uh, late. They, I did, took the job because they, they didn't care when I came in as long as it was clean for Sunday, so like vacuuming and buffing the floors and all that stuff. I hated that job, but that job allowed me to be independent and go to school and have a place I rented, and... And I actually gave joyfully out of that place because I had this real stirring of what God was doing in my life when I was 20 years old, 21 years old. So for us, the takeaway from here, a number of things, is I would just love everyone to go from here and on your own individual way, ask Jesus, what does it look like for me to steward my resource as well? That's going to look different for all of us. But if, if you're willing to have an open conversation where everything's wide open, then it'll be really cool to see what God does. And my... Um, My intuition, my hope is that as we all respond to that, we see how amazing it is that God's leading each of us individually, but as a collective, we're gonna be okay. And if we're not, then we'll make some changes. But it's time for us to step up, and I'm inviting you to consider what partnership in this way would really look like. So a few different ways that could look as you go away and think about this. So there's that thing where little babies grab onto coffee tables and they shuffle around. I think it's called cruising. I've asked a couple people, they said it is. So it's that cruising stage to when the baby first starts taking its first initial steps. Some of you have never taken a step in this way at all. You've kind of always held on, never really opened up, never kind of stepped out. And so your first step in this may be the idea of how do I give anything? And that is the legitimate discipleship step. And and that's between you and Jesus to say, well, what does that amount look like? For some of you, it may be the idea of giving $50 a month to show that I'm with and participating in a broader kingdom mission is a huge step, and that is an amazing step. For others people, that is not really a push or a step. There's nothing radical about that. That is like the simplest thing you can do. But maybe you're still not giving anything now, and that is still a step in the right direction. Um, so consider that. What does it mean to let go and take that first step in giving and join us? Um, there's an Old Testament principle around tithing that sometimes gets brought up by churches. Um, we're not going to go into it, but the Old Testament, the Jewish people had this um, practice of tithing, which was a percentage of what they had, and it was like this 10% offering to, to be a part of the, what God was doing in and through their nation as a chosen people. So 10% sometimes gets tossed around. Now, I'm not saying it is, but maybe for you, your next step is to lock into a percentage of, I make this much a year, and I want to give 5% of that, or I want to give 10%. 12%. I don't know, but maybe for you, as you're working in this room and praying about it, it gets tied into a percentage of what it means to kind of step out that way. So consider what that could look like. Perhaps that's the deal. There is another idea. I totally stole this, but the idea of a salary cap. So um, 
Some of you will know the name Rich Mullins. Many of you will not know this name. So Rich Mullins was this like Christian singer in the 80s and 90s. And uh, he died tragically. He was uh, changing a flat tire on his car, his Jeep, and, and a truck didn't see him and hit him as he was changing his tire. So he died really, really tragically. And um, I wasn't super into Rich Mullins' music, but I, my roommate in university like loved Rich Mullins. <laughs> Like, if I had to hear, like, the hammered dulcimer, like, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, but what I loved about Rich Mullins, if you're a Rich Mullins, if you don't know what the hammered dulcimer is, it's an amazing, beautiful instrument. Check it out when you leave. Um, but my, my housemate, Jim, like, was, like, every Saturday morning, he'd put it in, and I was like, oh, for the love of God, turn that down. <laughs> Anyways, what I love about Rich Mullins, he had a salary cap. So he was a super successful musician in the States. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in album sales and royalties made loads of money. But what he chose to do is he didn't want to be defined by his wealth or his money. He had a board of advisors who managed his money, and he set his cap, a sal salary cap for himself, at an average laborer's wage in his state. I think he lived in New Mexico. And I think it was like the mid to high 20s thousand dollars a year at that point. And that's all he would get a year. And anything else he didn't want to know about, because he knew it would, how hard it would be for him to wrestle with that. So the board advised that he set his salary cap, and the rest was given away. He said, I don't want me being just faithful with my gifts and stewarding that well meant for him a salary cap. Now, that's, that may seem like, man, that is crazy. But maybe some of you are in that place where you're like, it's, God's asking me to be kind of crazy with this, and it means a salary cap. And then if I'm successful in my work, my business, whatever that looks like, that money is then considered Jesus' kingdom money. And, and then you pray about, God, how do you want to invest that and use that? So those are just some really quick things. But here's the thing. If you've never had this conversation, if you're struggling, if you're wrestling financially, if you've never told someone about your struggles, if you need a safe place to talk, uh, Bobby and I want to be that for you or point you in the direction of someone who can be a good resource for you in that way. If you're not sure how this ties to discipleship, you still have questions, we're going to talk about it in our midweek groups as we're having dinner this week and it will be an ongoing conversation. But here's my hope and here's what's going to happen. Over the next couple months, I'll be getting in touch with everyone who calls, who I would, this will be weird. If I get in touch with you and you're like, I'm not really part of reunion, then I've misread your attendance. <laughs> but I'm hoping I, to get in touch with everyone who's kind of a core part of what we're doing and ask you to tell me privately what is God saying to you so that when we hit 2017, we have an accurate budget and picture of where we hope we can go together. Because right now, we have a little bit of history. We don't have enough history to really know where we're going. And so I need to know if I need to start bartending on Saturday nights for tips. I thought that was a funny joke, but maybe not. <laughs> but, which, which sounds kind of fun in its own way. But we need to have an idea of where we're going as a church. And so it's not meant to be awkward or weird for you. So I'm asking up front for forgiveness if that feels like that's none of your business. And if I contact you and you say, hey, this is a private thing, but we're processing it, rather not talk about it, then that's okay. I probably will not follow up with you again. But I do want to be proactive as a friend and as a pastor say, hey, what's God saying to you? Because I want to learn from that. I want to be encouraged by that. I want to be challenged by that. And then I want us to be able to have a good picture of where we're going in 2017. So that's about all I have to say about that. Um, here's what we're going to do. Every time, we have, every time we teach, every time we have a morning together like this, we count our privilege to be together with other friends who are either have already said yes to Jesus or who are considering what saying yes to Jesus looks like. And we try to be honest and authentic and vulnerable. We try to admit areas that we're good and kind of feel like we're on track and also be honest about areas that we're struggling. And I, in this room, I bet we have people in all different areas when it comes to your finances. So however we can, I just want to say this, however we can serve you and partner, please let us know. We want to have that, and then we will be back in touch. But I want to do, I want to pray, and then um, I think Kayla's is coming up in a second to lead us through communion. But I want to pray and just have a little bit of space to be quiet and, um, and begin to invite Jesus into this place that often is the quiet taboo, please don't talk to me. But at least in this way, invite Jesus into those places, and then we'll see what happens over the coming months. But thanks for at least having this conversation. I'm so encouraged, guys, by what God has been doing in our church and where we're going. And it's just being honest to say, for this next stage of the journey, we need people to say, here's what I can do, and here's how I'm throwing my hat in the ring. And uh, it's all about exciting adventure stuff, faithfully taking that next step forward. But I'm just saying we need to do this together. So thanks for uh, chatting. Let me pray, 
And then uh, I think Drew and the crew is coming up and Kayla will come up in a second. So let me just give you a minute just to kind of be quiet. So God, as we take this moment to be quiet, um, we want to just acknowledge your presence here by your spirit and invite you to begin and continue to speak to us in this area of finances and stewardship and possessions and money. So we just are quiet here for a moment and wait on you. In the stillness of this moment, God, we acknowledge that you are good. We sang that earlier, but you are so good and so faithful that that goodness and faithfulness transcends what we're immediately going through in our moment, whether we're kind of in a, in a high zone in our life where we're feeling like everything is falling into place the way we always hoped it would, or whether we're facing difficulty and challenges in front of us. God, thank you that you are constant, that your love and grace and faithfulness is there. God, as we have this conversation about money, we admit and are open-handed that it's a tough one to have and it pushes some of our buttons. But God, help that not to shut us down. Hope it Help us to be willing to be open with what this looks like around the midweek tables as we have dinner this week, as we talk with our spouses or with our families, or as we invite maybe a close friend into our circle. God, teach us what that means to move forward in that way. We trust you, God, for our well-being and the ability to continue on as a church in a financial way. We know that you can meet those needs in all kinds of creative ways. But God, help us to know what our participation each as individual members of this church looks like. Um, Jesus is about discipleship. It's about saying, everything I have is yours. What does it mean to participate in this kingdom adventure? God, our heart as a church has always been for people who have said yes to Jesus to be reignited with the passion of what following Jesus looks like. And for those who have never said yes or never decided to follow Jesus to take that step and say yes for the first time. And we celebrate that those things have all happened here. Thank you for the new birth, the new life, the new brothers and sisters who've said yes to Jesus. Thank you for those who have been struggling, who are reimagining participation and stepping in again. God, thank you by your spirit. You are leading us and directing us. And we just trust you even in this conversation and in the months ahead as we make plans and try to do our best to steward what you give us. Um, that's it. Jesus, this is for you, for your glory, for your honor. We want to be people of change and transformation, and so we want to open up the places that feel most vulnerable, and money is certainly one of those places. So we respond now as a community. We sing. We share these elements. Continue to lead us. Thank you for this crew. Love them so much. 